the uh, discussions about uh, R2P or its cousin humanitarian intervention are regularly disturbed by a skeleton in the closet uh, history to the present moment, not past history. Uh, throughout history, uh, to the present moment, there are a few principles of international affairs that apply quite generally. Uh, one is the maxim of Thucydides, that the strong do as they wish, while the weak suffer as they must. Uh, a corollary is what Ian Brownlee, uh, distinguished uh, international legal specialist, uh, what he calls uh, the hegemonial approach to lawmaking. The voice of the powerful sets precedence. Uh, another principle derives from uh, Adam Smith's account of policy making in England. As he put it, the principal architects of policy, in his day the merchants and manufacturers, uh, make sure that their own interests are most peculiarly attended to, however grievous the effects on others, including the people of England, but far more so those who are subject to uh, what he calls the savage injustice of the Europeans, uh, particularly in conquered India, Smith's own prime concern. A third principle is that virtually every use of force in international affairs has been justified in humanitarian terms, including the worst monsters. Uh, just to illustrate in a standard scholarly study of humanitarian intervention, uh, Sean Murphy cites uh, only three examples of humanitarian intervention between the kellogg briand Pact and uh, the UN Charter, Japan's attack on Manchuria, and Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia, and Hitler's occupation of parts of Czechoslovakia, uh, all accompanied by lofty rhetoric and factual justifications. And the basic pattern continues to the present moment. The historical record is worth recalling when we hear R2P or its cousin described as an emerging norm in international affairs. Uh, in reality, it has been considered a norm as far back as we want to go. Uh, so the founding of this country is an example. Uh, in 1629, the Massachusetts Bay Colon uh, Colony was granted its charter by the King of England, stating that rescuing the natives from their bitter pagan fate is the principal end of this plantation. Uh, the great seal of the colony depicts an Indian saying, come over and help us. So the English colonists were thus dedicated to their responsibility to protect as they proceeded to uh, extirpate and exterminate uh, the indigenous population in their words uh, and for their own good, as their honored successors explained. Uh, in 1630, uh, John Winthrop delivered his famous sermon depicting the new nation ordained by God as a city on the hill. Uh, that's inspirational rhetoric that is regularly invoked to this day uh, to justify any crime as at worst a deviation from the noble mission. Now, there's no difficulty adding similar examples from other great powers in their day in the sun. Uh, the powerful are free to say that we should forget history and look forward. Uh, for the weak, it's not a wise choice. The skeleton in the closet uh, made its appearance in the first case considered by the International Court of Justice 60 years ago, the Corfu Channel case. Uh, the court determined, quoting, that it can only regard the alleged right of intervention as the manifestation of a policy of force, such as has in the past given rise to the most serious abuses, and such as cannot, whatever be the defects in international organization, find a place in international law. From the nature of things, intervention would be reserved for the most powerful states and might easily lead to perverting the administration of justice itself. Uh, the same perspective informed the first ever meeting of the South Summit 
of 133 states uh, convened in April 2000. Uh, its declaration, uh, surely with the bombing of Serbia in mind, rejected what it called the so-called right of humanitarian intervention, which has no legal basis in the United Nations Charter or the general principles of international law. Uh, the word, wording has been repeated since, uh, among others, by the ministerial meeting of the non-aligned movement in Malaysia in 2006, again representing the traditional victims. The same conclusion was drawn in 2004 by the high-level UN panel on threats, challenges, and change. Uh, the panel adopted the view of the ICJ and the non-aligned movement, concluding that uh, Article 51 needs neither extension nor restriction of its long understood scope. Uh, the panel added that for those impatient with such a response, the answer must be that in a world full of perceived potential threats, the risk to the global order and the norm of non-intervention on which it continues to be based is simply too great for the legality of unilateral preventive action to be accepted. Allowing one to act is to allow all, which is, of course, unthinkable. Uh, the same position, the same basic position, was adopted by the uh, World Summit in 2005. Uh, the summit also asserted the willingness to take collective action through the Security Council in accordance with the Charter should peaceful means be inadequate and national uh, authorities are failing, manifestly failing to protect their populations from serious crimes. Now that phrase sharpens the wording of Article 42 uh, at most in clarifying the conditions for the Security Council to resort to force and it keeps the skeleton in the closet if, and it's a large if, uh, the, we can regard the Security Council as a neutral arbiter, not subject to the maxims of Thucydides and Adam Smith. I'll come back to that. Uh, there have been some departures from the Corfu Channel restriction and its descendants. The Constitutive Act of the African Union asserts the right of the Union to intervene in a member state in respect of grave circumstances. Now that differs crucially from the Charter of the Organization of American States, which bars intervention for any reason whatever in the internal or external affairs of any other state. The reasons for the difference are clear. The OAS Charter seeks to de deter intervention by the Colossus of the North and has of course failed to do so up to the present. Uh, but uh, after the collapse of the apartheid states, the African Union faced no comparable problem. Now, if the African Union doctrine were to extend to the OAS or NATO, then its members would be entitled to intervene within their own alliance. Now, that idea yields interesting and revealing uh, conclusions, uh, uh, which I don't have time to go into. Uh, but they would be inoperative uh, in any event, thanks to the maxim of Thucydides. Now, there is a high-level proposal to extend R2P beyond the African Union doctrine. Uh, it's in the report of the International Commission, uh, which advocates action within area of jurisdiction by regional or sub-regional organizations under Chapter 8 of the Charter. Uh, that the skeleton in the closet rattles rather loudly at this point. Uh, the powerful unilaterally declare their area of jurisdiction. So for NATO, it includes the Balkans and now Afghanistan and beyond. Uh, Sec Secretary General uh, Yaptahop Sheffer informed a NATO meeting in June 2007, quoting him that NATO troops have to guard pipelines that transport oil and gas that is directed for the, rest, for the West and more generally have to protect sea routes used by tankers and other crucial infrastructure of the energy system. Now, the expansive rights accorded by the International Commission 
are restricted to the powerful, uh, radically violating the principles of Corfu Channel and its descendants, and opening the door for potential use of R2P as a weapon for imperial in, uh, intervention at will. Uh, the Corfu Channel principle, uh, which runs right through the World Summit, uh, provides considerable insight into the selectivity and timing of R2P and its cousin. The alleged uh, normative revolution, as it's described, uh, took place in the 1990s, immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, which had, in earlier years, uh, provided an automatic pretext for intervention, however frail the argument. The uh, Bush administration, senior Bush administration, uh, reacted to the fall of the Berlin Wall with an official exposition of Washington's new course. In brief, everything will stay the same, uh, but with new pretexts. So we still need a huge military system, but for a new reason, uh, what they called the technological sophistication of third world powers. Uh, we have to maintain the, indust the defense industrial base it's a euphemism for state-supported high-tech industry. Uh, we must maintain intervention forces directed at the Middle East uh, energy-rich regions, where the, th I'm quoting, where the threats to our interests that required military intervention could not be laid at the Kremlin's door, uh, contrary to decades of pretense. So new pretexts for intervention were needed, and the normative revolution soon took place. Uh, the uh, natural interpretation of the timing gained support from the selectivity of application of R2P and its cousin. Uh, there was, of, thought, of course, no thought of applying the principle to the Iraq sanctions administered by the Security Council, uh, condemned as genocidal by the two directors of the Oil for Food program, the respected international diplomats, Dennis Halliday and Hans von Sponek, uh, both of whom resigned uh, because of their genocidal character. Uh, von Sponek's detailed study of the horrendous impact of the sanctions has been under a virtual ban in the U.S. and U.K. The primary agents of the programs, they were, they were administered by the Security Council. Uh, there's no thought today of protection of the people of Gaza that's another UN responsibility, uh, along with the rest of the protected population uh, under the Geneva Conventions, uh, also denied fundamental human rights. In these and uh, numerous other cases, the selectivity conforms with considerable precision to the maxim of Thucydides and the expectation of the uh, ICJ 60 years ago. Uh, perhaps the most striking illustration of the radical selectivity was in 1999 uh, when NATO bombed Serbia. Uh, that's an attack featured in Western discourse as the jewel in the crown of the normative revolution, the emerging norm. Uh, that was when the U.S. was at the height of its glory in leading the enlightened states uh, uh, leading the enlightened states, uh, the leadership in the hands of an, of an uh, idealistic new world bent on ending inhumanity everywhere, uh, to cite just a few of the flood of accolades by Western intellectuals. Uh, there are a few difficulties confronting this flattering self-image. Uh, one problem is that the traditional victims of Western intervention vigorously objected. I've already quoted the stand of the non-aligned movement. Uh, Nelson Mandela was particularly harsh in his condemnation. Well, that problem was not serious, easily overcome. The views of the unworthy are easily ignored, as indeed they were. Uh, furthermore, the uh, bombing plainly violated the UN Charter. Uh, that problem, too, was easily put to rest. Uh, the, as the Goldstone Commission determined, the bombing was illegal but legitimate. Uh, they reached that conclusion by reversing the chronology of bombing and atrocities, uh, which leads to a third problem, the facts, uh, which happen to be very richly documented in this case 
from impeccable Western sources. And what they reveal is unequivocal. The NATO bombing did not end the atrocities, but rather precipitated by far the worst of them, as had been anticipated by the NATO command and the White House. Uh, the conclusions that are so richly documented by the Western records are reinforced by the indictment of Milosevic issued by the International Tribunal at the height of the bombing. With a single exception, the crimes charged followed the bombing, and we can be confident that the one pre-bombing charge, the Rachak massacre, was of little principled concern to the U.S. and Britain, if only because at the very same time they were not only condoning but supporting, actively supporting, much more serious crimes in East Timor, where the background of atrocities was incomparably more grotesque than anything that had happened in the Balkans. And this, incidentally, is only one of many examples right at that time. Well, this problem, too, was overcome quite simply by virtual suppression of the ample record. Actually, the case of East Timor is particularly instructive. And just to add a personal note, I testified about it at the Fourth Committee in 1978 when atrocities reached the level, I'm quoting, of extermination as a crime against humanity committed against the East Timorese population. It's the words of the later uh, UN-sponsored uh, Truth Commission. Uh, and 1978 was also the year in which Britain and France joined the United States in supporting extermination as a crime against humanity and continued to do so right through 1999. Uh, as atrocities sharply mounted once again. Uh, after the final paroxysm of state terror in September 1999, which destroyed most of what remained of the country, uh, National Security Advisor Sandy Berger said that the United States would continue its support of the aggressors, explaining that I don't think anybody ever articulated a doctrine uh, which said we ought to intervene whenever there's a humanitarian problem. And so R2P vanished in the standard way. Uh, to end the atrocities in this case would not have required any action, not bombing, not sanctions, any other act, beyond withdrawal of participation. And that was demonstrated shortly after Berger's reaffirmation of U.S. policy when, under strong domestic and international pressure, uh, President Clinton formally ended U.S. participation. The invaders immediately withdrew, and a U.N. peacekeeping force was able to enter, facing no army. Uh, that could have been done at any time in the preceding quarter century. Astonishingly, this horrendous story uh, has since been reinterpreted as a vindication of R2P, it's a reaction so shameful that words fail. Well, I mentioned that the consensus of the World Summit adheres to the Corfu principle and its descendants only if we assume that the Security Council is a neutral arbiter. It plainly is not. Uh, the uh, Council is controlled by its five permanent members, and they're far from equal in operative authority. Uh, one indication of the difference is the record of vetoes. That's the most extreme form of violation of a Security Council resolution. Now, the relevant period is from the mid-1960s, when decolonization and recovery from wartime destruction uh, gave the UN at least uh, some standing as representative of world opinion. Uh, since that time, the U.S. is far in the lead in vetoes, Britain is second, uh, no one else is even close. Uh, in the past quarter century, uh, China and France have vetoed three resolutions, Russia four, uh, the United Kingdom 10, and the United States 43, including even resolutions calling on all states to observe international law. The skeleton in the closet uh, nods in recognition as the maxim of Thucydides uh, strikes again. Now, American public opinion it brings up a further consideration. The maxims that uh, uh, actually one way to mitigate this defect in the World Summit consensus, and it's a serious one, would be to eliminate the veto. Okay. 
uh, that's incidentally uh, in accord with the will of the majority of Americans. Uh, they believe that the uh, United States should follow the will of the majority and that the UN, not the United States, should take the lead in international crises. Uh, but that's not on the political agenda because we run up again against Adam Smith's maxim, which ensures that such heresies are unthinkable, uh, as much so as applying R2P to those who desperately need protection but are not on the favored list of the powerful. Uh, American public opinion uh, brings up an important consideration. Uh, the maxims that largely guide international affairs in practice are not graven in stone. And in fact, they've become considerably less harsh over the years as a result of the civilizing effect of popular movements. And for that continuing and essential project, R2P can be a valuable tool, uh, much as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is. Uh, even though states do not adhere to the UD and some formally reject much of it, uh, nonetheless, the, it serves as an ideal that uh, activists can appeal to in educational and organizational efforts, uh, often effectively. And my suspicion is that a major contribution of the discussion of R2P may turn out to be rather similar. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um,